and welcome back to UNISA. And we're coming to you this morning from the Florida uh, campus, which is, of course, in Rudderport, west of Johannesburg. And I must say, it's just been such an eye-opener because I think many of us, when we think of UNISA, we think humanities, you know, uh, think about the people you know who have degrees or uh, qualifications from UNISA. What would they have qualified in? It's usually law, uh, you know, a BCom or, you know, psychology. It's, it's, it's usually the humanities that we think of. But we are now moved from that main entrance and we are at the Eureka building, uh, which is this uh, passage that we've just come through. And this is, of course, the uh, College for Science and Innovation here at UNISA. And uh, we are at uh, Nanotechnology and Water Sustainability Institute. And this is, of course, where we're going to look at this very important issue of water and what UNISA is doing for the country in this regard. But I just quickly want to recap on something that the Vice Chancellor spoke about, which is, of course, these 10 niche areas that UNISA have actually embarked on. So those 10 niche areas are, and I'm going to read them to you, nanotechnology, and uh, then it's water sustainability, which is where we are right now. Um, they also are niching into other areas, and and um, they are um, automotive studies, aviation and uh, aeronautical studies, marine studies, uh, space studies, and uh, the square kilometer array. Uh, there's also the fourth industrial revolution and uh, digitalization, natural sciences, health studies and medicine. This one is interesting. Feminist womanist and Busadi theorizations. And this is about promoting gender studies and theorizations that focus on feminist, womanist, and Busadi perspectives to advance social justice and equality. And then there's also student support and co-curricular activity. So you can see what that reflects is, of course, UNISA's commitment to contemporary challenges that society faces. But as I say, we are now at the Institute for Nanotechnology and water sustainability. And I'm joined by the head here, uh, Professor uh, Thabo Nkambule. Prof, thanks so much for welcoming us so warmly here. Thank you very much, Sakina, and a warm welcome to you and the viewers. So talk to us about uh, what you do here at this institute. Yes, the Institute for Nanotechnology and Water Sustainability is an institute uh, of the University of South Africa at the College of Science, Engineering and Technology. And uh, as you are aware, the College of Science, Engineering and Technology uh, is currently number one in chemical engineering in, in, in the country. We are paired with Stellenbosch. In particular, iNanos uh, is at the forefront of advancing innovative solutions that currently address uh, emerging and uh, um, current issues relating to water scarcity and uh, water quality. And we are centered um, here at the college uh, where we also uh, are part of the uh, catalytic niche areas, in particular work on marine sciences and marine studies, as well as energy, and also uh, on the 4IR. And we are mixing all of this uh, to come up innovatively with solutions that uh, respond uh, to the issues of water scarcity and water quality in the country. Right now we are getting into one of our laboratories, uh, which is a water quality laboratory. And as you will be aware, uh, when you are solving issues of water quality, one of the most important things uh, to do before uh, any uh, solution is to actually understand what is your water quality, what is your pollutants, and uh, what is the constituents of everything that is polluting water. And this is our analytical chemistry lab where we actually do those uh, analysis. All right, I'm going to park you for the time being because I quickly just want to move around here as uh, we uh, enter this lab just to take a look at what is around us. Very important work being done here at uh, the Institute for um, uh, Nanotechnology and Water Sustainability. And of course, as you can see, some students uh, here as well. So we're just going to move in a little bit just to find out exactly what it is that they are busy with. And I met her earlier, Rat Ratanang Mlaba Zwane, and she's here. Ratanang, good morning. And you're very busy starting very early in the morning. So what exactly are you busy with? 
Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a PhD student here at INONOS, and what what interested me to come to this institute is because of the institute's drive at um, conducting research that are meaningful. So, and the other reason is that the institute has some state of the art, top of the range instrument like this one, which is. Um, uh, 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 a GC by GC time of light mass spectrometer. This instrument enhances the separation of the analytes, especially those are those are those that are complex that are found in our water systems or water bodies. So this instrument it, it has a multi-purpose sampler, which is a robotic auto sampler, which automates the sample introduction from this file into the instrument, and then from there we get. Um, we get results that are shown in this monitor and then this instrument has a built-in library with, which helps us to identify the compounds that are present in the samples based on the based on the on the structure on the structural formula as well as as well as comparing them to the ones that are available in the database as we can as we can see from this that identified compounds we can see them do, based on their similarities so as we can see in this sample that i analyzed we had uh, detected ibuprofen and then the instrument showed that we have 89.89.8 percent assurance that this compound is detected in this sample so this is what we we can say that is a true identification of the sample. So is that a water sample? Yes, this is a water sample that was collected in a wastewater treatment plant. So, yes. That's very interesting, a wastewater treatment plant and there is... Ibuprofen. Isn't that like what we take when we're not well sometimes? Or so? <laughs> exactly, that is the case. This ibuprofen is one of the pharmaceuticals that we take in and then they end up, we excrete them and then they end up into the sewers and then they make their way into the treatment plants. And some of the treatment plants, they don't have the capacity in removing these contaminants and these contaminants, they end up into the water systems. And with these, it serves as a problem to the water quality monitoring because as you can see, this is ibuprofen, but there are other contaminants that are present besides this ibuprofen. And then the toxicological effect that we get exposed to is a result of the complex mixtures rather than as an individual compound. This is absolutely fascinating because if I think ibuprofen, I'm thinking tablets. And, and now we're finding this in our water samples. And this obviously then has to be decontaminated somehow. Yes. So that's why I also mentioned that the treatment plants, they, they are not built to completely remove these, these contaminants. So they find their ways into the water systems. And then it is a problem. Of course it's a problem. So we consume, we could potentially consume water that contains ibuprofen. Yes. We could consume water that are contaminated with ibuprofen. Besides us being being exposed to these contaminants, we can also be exposed to them through the aquatic organisms because these contaminants, they bioaccumulate on the tissues of the living organisms in the aquatic environment. So what do you then do with this information? So what I do with this information is that, the, as I explained, that this is a chemical analysis analytical technique. So however, with this instrument, we cannot get the full picture of the quality of the water. So that's where I need to introduce effect-based method. So with effect-based method, we are able to get the toxicological effect that um, that we might get when we get exposed to these contaminants. So with the effect-based method, it can improve the water quality monitoring assessments in our country because of effect-based method have only been up developed and applied in European countries, but in South Africa, the standard operation procedures as well as the economic operation development methods for them, they have not yet been developed. So my project is now implementing this effect-based method so that I can be able to develop the SOPs that can be implemented in South African water context. Wow, I must say that is absolutely fabulous and, and, and I must say your explanation, even just poor old me standing here could understand all of that. Um, I must say I'm dying to see what the, the inside of this uh, particular uh, a vessel looks like because you said you take the vial yes, from uh, that side. Yes, this is a this is an automator. 
it's a multi, it's, it's, a sum, it's a sum, automated sampler. So what it does, once we switch on the instrument, it will just move as it, it's automated, and then mm -hmm. it will inject the sample, collect the sample from the vial, and then it will move back and then inject the sample here, and it will go in through into the, into the instrument and this instrument uses two columns that are in series and then from that from those columns the sample will move to the time of flight mass spectroscopy well, this, of course, PhD student here at UNISA, and uh, this is Ratanang Mlabazwane. Thank you so much uh, for your time this morning. That was absolutely fascinating, Prof. I mean, you know, you think about water and, you know, water quality, which is, of course, very tropical for us in South Africa at the moment, and the work that you're doing here is absolutely pivotal. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, over and above this, we're also implementing drone technology now. Uh, which is part of our routine quality monitoring in partnership uh, with Professor Peter Motebeli, uh, uh, who is currently in China uh, working on this to ensure then that everything that we do is uh, done in real time. Uh, so of the, poly, the, the quality the water is, we then need to develop technologies mm -hmm. that will help us uh, remove the pollutants that Ratanam was uh, talking about. And one of the solutions we have is using technology as an enabler. And well, just some fascinating conversations taking place at the UNISA Florida campus where Sakina is broadcasting from. Just apologies, it looks like our uh, link to them is broken. I can see that they're indoors and they're trying to sort of meander through the passageways and obviously that signal not doing too well. I'm hoping we'll be able to pick it up. But uh, at this point, looks like it's it's not. We're not able to go back to them right now. And we're talking about the whole um, Institute of Nano technology and water sustainability, which is really interesting. Where you know it, it, it's quite fascinating to see what's in our water supply, and that's just a, a little bit of a, a worry. Ibuprofen being one of them. So anyway, very very interesting things coming out there. So it's all about the uh, the College of Science, Engineering, and Technology that's uh, working and trying to talk to the emerging issues relating to water quality and water scarcity. So that's what we're talking about uh, at UNISA. But I tell you another thing we should be talking about is the water scarcity. More importantly, when it comes to people receiving it, it just blows my mind because you kind of have a look and see what's happening at the Val River. And then you look at areas, particularly, um, I mean, I'm sure I'm talking to you as well, where there's just no supply of water, where there's just such a problem with all of the pipes and everything else that is happening. And we just have so many conversations to have around water and uh, it's a never ending one, it really is. But uh, yeah, interesting, interesting ones coming from uh, UNISA there.